So there is a wide variety of different oncological emergencies that can in impact on critical care. Spinal cord compressions are one of them. Now, most uh, spinal cord compressions don't cause problems with the airway or requiring vasopressive support or many of the other uh, traditional reasons why somebody may need critical care, but may present to a, a hospital where they provide specialized neuroscience or neurosurgical care and the critical care physician may be involved in that. They present mostly as, um, as a spinal cord type injury and so are often treated as such. Now spinal cord compression from a malignancy occurs in only about 5% of all patients who have a known malignancy and it's usually when they're already in the terminal phases of their, of di their disease, typically within the last two years of their life. Metastases are uh, usually arise um, from other sites and spread to the bone and don't arise primarily from the, bone, from the ver vertebra itself. They are usually located in the vertebra body itself and then impinge on the thecal sac um, as opposed to growing around or growing inside the spinal canal itself. The vast majority of, of malignancies that cause this type of problem are lung cancers, breast cancers, and prostate cancers. Although a few of the hematological malignancies such as multiple myeloma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can also cause, uh, cause uh, spinal cord compression. Oftentimes, the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma present not necessarily as disease within the bony structure itself, but in the surrounding uh, paravertebral um, lymph node tissue that then inv invades into the thecal sac um, from uh, outside inwards. Then rarely you can also get uh, renal cell cancers that will also spread to the uh, vertebra and, also, and cause uh, impingement on the thecal sac. The vertebrae particularly are victims because, uh, from this because they have a very rich blood supply. These tumors are also usually closely located to where the, uh, to where the vertebra are, uh, are um, such as the breast and the, and the renal cell cancers uh, and the lung cancers. And then also these, bone, these particular types of tumors have a particular affinity for bone. So a large vascular supply, an, uh, an ability to, to, um, uh, to bind and to, uh, to, to stop within a, ver within a bony tissue and then spread from there, make those patients with these types of malignancies that much more likely to develop a spinal cord compression. So back pain is the most frequent symptom associated with spinal cord compression and unfortunately is frequently missed and most patients present in retrospect with about a two month history of progressive back pain. A history of back pain in a malignancy should raise some flags and should spurn some further investigations before it actually causes a neurological injury. About 75% of these, of these patients will present with some combination of focal weakness, ataxia, or full out paralysis. Half of these patients develop bowel and bladder problems uh, specifically um, and, often, and will present um, with a, a very clear spinal cord syndrome. The best way to make the diagnosis is to do an MRI. After a good clinical exam, you'll usually see evidence of the uh, uh, you'll see clinical evidence of the um, of the spinal cord injury. A CT scan of the will often not reveal as much, but then the MRI is then done to provide uh, a full, complete assessment of the spinal cord, the involvement of the, uh, the uh, other spots, because frequently other vertebrae are also involved in in this uh, in this condition, and then. Uh, and uh, also then the MRI will show you specifically where the injury to the spinal cord is and how much, uh, how much uptake and uh, edema is present. As I've said before, you need to make sure that you don't just image the area specifically for, uh, involved in the uh, neurological symptoms, but also image the, other, the rest of the spinal cord to ensure that there's no other spots uh, of metastatic disease that would be potentially causing trouble in the near future. So the treatment for spinal cord uh, compression from a malignancy is almost strictly palliative. These people already have evidence of metastatic disease and their tumor itself is not curable. And so before proceeding on any treatment course, you need to make sure that everything is in line with their goals of care and that appropriate end of life conversations have been had. Your goals in treatment for this, in this case are to try to preserve as much neurological function as possible to give them as much good quality of life as they can Stabilize any bones that are, that are in imminent risk of collapse if they haven't already uh, collapsed. Try to control some of the tumor 
uh, burden, but a complete debulking is unrealistic, and most importantly, for pain control. Now, in many cases, these tumors have some degree of sensitivity to uh, steroids, and so high-dose steroids can often be your first choice. This may especially be the case in those uh, such, uh, such as the uh, uh, lymphomas, um, which are usually reasonably sensitive to steroids uh, and may, may provide some immediate relief. Now, the only other treatment, uh, non-surgical treatment uh, for this is, uh, is radiotherapy. And this can be useful if the tumor itself is radiosensitive. So it's important that you actually have a diagnosis first. Rarely people will present with a spinal cord connect, uh, compression as their first symptom of their malignancy. Um, and in those cases, it's often, it's often a uh, lymphoma that's actually the source. But the vast majority of other patients already know that they have cancer. Radiotherapy uh, can work in cases of lymphoma, myeloma, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and then small cell lung cancer. Um, <clears throat> so if this tumor is known to be radiosensitive, or the type of tumor is known to be radiosensitive, then referral to uh, radiation therapy is, is a good start. Now surgery is not unfortunately necessarily going to be helpful um, because the, the tumor itself is invaded into the vertebral body itself and to, to resect that, uh, that uh, tumor uh, and, and stabilize the, uh, the spinal cord uh, will require a fairly extensive operation um, and uh, should only be considered when the spine itself is unstable um, and <clears throat> can relieve the pressure on the, uh, on the spinal cord uh, and, try and, and try and reduce their symptoms. So you should talk to your neurosurgical colleagues, but don't expect that they're necessarily going to be able to help you because the nature of the surgery could be such that they're just not going to be a good candidate for this. Um, but there are certain circumstances where they can debride a little bit and clear out a canal and maybe give some relief of symptoms. But doing a full corpectomy and, uh, and, uh, and rod stabilization is, is probably just, just not going to happen. Um, so again, as I've said, it's also important that you focus on symptom and pain control and have a full frank discussion with the family and the patient about their goals of care because this is usually a life, uh, a life ending uh, condition with an associated high, high risk of poor quality of life uh, into the coming weeks to days to months depending on how long the patient is left to live. All right, well, that's everything. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, don't uh, be afraid to leave comments in the section below or contact me directly.